All right, we're starting. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians today, chapter 3. We're going to pick up on verse 14, read to 21. We're going to start a new sermon series today, Our Unwritten Story. I plan on being into it for a while, so. Book of Ephesians, chapter 3. We're going to pick up on verse 14, read down to 21. I'm assuming most people are there. I don't really hear any pages, so we're going to, we're going to see what God's Word has to say to us this morning. <laughs> Book of Ephesians chapter 3, going to pick up on verse 14. All right, let's see what God's Word has to say. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Um, our unwritten story. You know, no matter what you got going on in your life, how you've messed up, whatever's happening, our story is still unwritten. It's not finished yet. Our story has only been partially told. Now, there's been some high spots and there's been some low spots. But our story is still not complete. Until we take our last breath, our story is still unwritten. It is not complete yet. You might be thinking it's, it's finished. You might feel like at different times in your life, this is finished. How am I ever going to move forward? Well, the good news is your story is still unwritten. This tells me to live my life with my arms wide open because yesterday is history. I can't go back and change a thing. Today is a gift. The rest is still unwritten. It's not finished yet. And you get to play a part in that. Your decisions and how you move forward, how you grasp things in life, how you allow God to fill you in life and use you, that all plays a part. All that is still unwritten. A lot of stuff is still to happen. Now, as we work through this sermon, there's a couple questions I'm going to put up out front. Maybe we're going to work through them. We'll see how it goes. But when are the moments to make and leave an impact? And the second question is, are we embracing the opportunity set before us? Now, that's good news to me because, you know, regardless of how many times I've failed and I fell short and I've messed up, my story is still being written and it's not complete yet. That is good news. Now, here recently, I put some faith, uh, questions on Facebook. I like to do that because you get a wide variety. The vast amount of people on my friend list, a lot of them are not Christians. So you get a wide view of things. Um, but like any poll you take, you got to take it with a grain of salt because it depends on who you ask. Yeah, yeah when you see that stuff on TV, oh, we asked this many people and they said that, yeah, well, who did you ask? You don't tell me that. You know what I mean? It, that can mean anything. But I, I know these people. But the, what I asked is, I asked for people to describe in one word. Now, when you ask people to describe it in one word, some people, you know, they can't do that. They just can't seem to do that. You know what I mean? Some of them give me something this big on there and all that. But what I asked them to describe in one word is, it was three things. I asked them to describe Christians. I asked them to describe Jesus. And I asked them to describe the church. Now, many of the answers I got overlapped each other, which I think they should. You know what I mean? We're talking about Christians, Jesus, and the church. If they don't overlap each other, there's something wrong somewhere. Somebody's doing something wrong. But I, Most of them. But some of the answers I got were much different from each other. They, they didn't line up. They, they were things, you know, it didn't have anything to do with a loving God. It didn't have anything. Some of the stuff I got, I'm not going to repeat a lot of the stuff that I got. I'm not going to go into that because that's not really the point. But a lot of times it depends on who you ask. And you know what, as I think about it is, you know, we can't control what people think. You can't control nearly as much in this life as you think you can. And you certainly can't control what people think. 
But the good thing is, the three things that I mentioned, two of them, we have a direct impact on. It depends on, you know, how we proceed with things. That with being a Christian and how I develop as a Christian, that is on me. That is not on anybody else. We blame it on a lot of other people, but that is on me. I, I have to take direct responsibility in how as I mature and move forward as a Christian. And secondly, I get to help shape the church. You get to help shape the church, whether you think so or not. We all do. We play a part in that. The church is, is evolving a lot of times. Now, God's word never changes. It's absolute truth. But the church evolves in how we proceed things. As long as you stay in the truth, it doesn't really matter. Some things are not everybody's cup of tea. It don't have to be. Where does it have to be say that everything has to go the way I like it? That's not really the way it goes. But what I find is, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, I can have as much of God as I want. Now, there's a lot of times, you know what? I, people say, I'm saved, that's all I wanted. Praise God that you're saved. But that's only where it starts, not where it ends. The story is still being written. Yes, if you're saved, one day you will be in heaven. But that's where it starts. That is not where it ends. How many times do you see people that get saved and just, whoop, that's it? There's no maturing process. Can you imagine one day when they arrive in heaven? God's like, yeah, you're saved and you're here with me, but I had so much more for you. There was so much more I was going to do in your life. You know, that has a, as much as I want of God, has a direct impact on the difference I'm going to make in this world. If I only got a little bit of God, guess what? That's going to be, I'm going to have hard sledding. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for me. The more I have of God, the easier it's going to be because, you know what? You're going to be more focused on God than all the things that are affecting you. We're going to have a lot of things affect us that we have no control over. We didn't have anything to do with it. But you know what? We'll be able to make it through. We're going to have hope. We'll be able to sustain it through all these difficult things when I have more of God than more of Eddie. Like more of Eddie ain't a good thing. You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I know y'all are just saying, like, okay, yeah, it's just you. It's not me, you know. The church, which make, each of us make up, we can also have as much of God as we want to. I think, you know, some of the churches I've been in, some of them have more of God than others. It just depends how you allow God to move and how, you know, you know, things are not always what they seem. You ever thought you saw something and you didn't? I know last week I talked about seeing is believing and, and believing in how the world sees things, that is. And I, I, I use a little story, but I'm going to also, I'm going to use a story of the, the best story that I like are the true ones. They're the funniest things in life. You know, and things are not always what they seem. Now, I know you probably thought the same thing or seen things at different times. Now, I don't think I've ever shared this story in the pulpit. Now, maybe I've told a few of you at different times. This happened several years ago. You know, I'll never forget it. Me and a co-worker of mine, this happened 15 years ago, I guess. Uh, I was actually working with a guy that day. I'm doing the same type of work I do now. And uh, we, had, we got our work, and uh, right before we left, the, the, the service manager comes out and says, Hey, I got this. This, is a, this lady, she's not going to be home, but she doesn't, she doesn't, her heat's off, and she doesn't want her, her, she's got animals in the house and all this stuff. Can you all run down the street here and fix this lady's heat, get her going? I'm like, yeah, we'll do it before we can take her work, get her work. But there was also, he wrote on there, it was in big letters, Do not let the cat out. Make sure the cat does not get out. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you, know, you don't usually see that, you know, what have you. Uh, he's, and uh, when we went on, we got to the house, and this, it had like an enclosed porch on it. And uh, it said, be very careful, right? And even she had a note on the door. Please do not let cat out. What, I don't know what's special about this cat, but don't let it out. When we get there with this cat, you know, we've got a glimpse of him. He would just, as soon as he sees us, he's like terrified and he runs behind the furniture. I'm like, well, this cat ain't going to come out. <laughs> you know, you know every time we, we made a couple trips, to make a long story shorter, back and forth to the truck. And, and every now and then you see the cat, the same thing. He, I mean, he runs completely opposite the direction of the door. And uh, we'll make a long story short, we got all done. And we, of course, you got to always do paperwork. <laughs> My gosh. And we, we sit out there, we sit out in the driveway, and you can brighten up what we did, so they can fill her like that. And as we're sitting there, we both go like this. 
this cat is walking in front of the truck. <laughs> I'm like, man, I said, we got to get a hold of this cat. We're going to get fired. I don't know what's special about this cat. We're going to get fired, you know? And uh, we got out there. Believe it or not, it, it was winter time, so I had a lot of clothes on. We, we were able to catch that cat somehow. I don't know how he did it. You know, he was, he was fighting us too. I told the guy with me, because I had a hold of the cat. I had him ripped by his back like this, the cat's like this, and going on. I opened the door. I'm like, I owed him in there, right? Like, I said, man, that, how did that cat get out? Did you see? He said, no, I never saw the cat hardly. I said, I didn't either. I said, I don't know how he got out. Well, you know what? As I said, things are not always what they seem. Later that day, you know, it, it was late in the day. We were getting ready to wrap up. We were still out on the job, and uh, the service manager called, and he says, uh, how did the day go, guys? He was making small talk. I'm like, I don't know what he wants. How did the day go? I'm like, all right, I guess. You know, get everything done, yeah. He said, oh, he said, but I do have a question for you guys. He said, Mrs., I don't know what her name was, Jones called in, and uh, she had a question. I said, what was that? She wants to know how the neighbor's cat got in her house. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you want to take this one? <laughs> I don't know, you know what, I don't know what happened there, you know what, evidently the cat must have went in the house, it was an outdoor cat, that's why the cat, I, things are not always what they seem, that cat, they must have been twins or something, they, must, they look just alike to us, things are not always what they seem, I didn't mean to throw the neighbor's cat in the person's house, I didn't mean to, and they were outside, so I'm sure it made quite a mess. Things in life are not always what they seem, sometimes you think things are a certain way and they're not. You know what? I'm telling you, things are going to be difficult in your life at times, and it's going to look like everything is coming against you. I'm telling you, stay the course. Just keep doing the right thing. Are you going to mess up sometimes? Yeah, just like I messed up and threw the neighbor's cat in the house. I didn't mean to do it. I've messed up a lot of things in my life, and I didn't always mean to do it. Sometimes I just messed up. But sometimes, you know, I just got to move forward, and I got to stop worrying about what I messed up. I can't always go back and change things, but I can move forward. That's all we can do at times. And that was kind of what I was trying to get at there. Sometimes we just need to move forward. Just try and do the right thing. It's surprising how many times it'll turn our way if you just keep moving forward. I heard a quote from many years ago. Not only do I think it's a great quote, but I think it fits today's society and God's people, unfortunately. It said, one person with passion is better than 40 people merely interested. How many Christians are just kind of merely interested? They're saved, they're born again, but they're just kind of merely, they're just interested. For us to make a difference, it will take more than us just being interested. Interest is where it starts, but your passion is what you're going to follow. Many people say, Pastor, I don't know really what I'm called to do in this life, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do for God. I can't always answer that question for you, but I can tell you this. It, it, it makes it a lot easier to figure out. What is it that you're passionate about in life? What is it that you really love to do? What is it that you really, you know, what do you get excited about? Something, it might not be exactly that, but something in that category would be where your calling falls in. When I was in Bible school, when I was taking ministry classes, uh, the guy, he was in charge of the entire Wesleyan Church, all different aspects of the education program. And I know when I was taking classes, there were some people that, you know, everybody was all over the country, so they would take classes, and some of them I, I would never see again. And I would just ask, I asked him the question. I said, how many people start out taking classes, but they never finish? He says, well, he said, it's the same all across every denomination. He said 50%. He said they'll think they're called to be a preacher. And when they're be, actually, he said they're called into ministry like everybody is. But he said it's our job when the people first come in, and that's what they did with me, is to help them to realize where it is they belong. Some of these people are supposed to be preachers, but all of them are supposed to be doing other things in ministry. And we try to help them to find out where that is. That's why a lot of them never finish. See, everybody has ministry. Everybody has. Every Christian has something that you're supposed to be doing for God. Everybody thinks ministry is just something the preacher does. That is not the case at all. Everybody is called to something. God has a plan for you. 
For us to make a difference, you've got to follow your passion. Because, you know, how will you ever find where it is you belong if you don't go out and try? When people think about the church, it is thought of in many different ways. The New Testament meaning for the word of church actually means the called out ones. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really feel called out all the time. Sometimes, sometimes it's a struggle in life. Sometimes it's just difficult at times. It's not every day like that. But at times, I don't feel called out. As a Christian, as a part of the church, I have to ask myself, am I living as a called out one? Am I living that way? Some days the answer is yes. Some days I'm not, I'm not so sure. You know, some days are easier than others. I think the question... I think that is a question that's a follower of Christ that each of us should think about. Am I living for Christ? Am I living to try to be a called out one? Am I doing the best I can? I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. I'm not saying you're not going to fall short. We all do that. But am I doing the best I can? Now, something that I've experienced since I've been saved, because I was greener than grass when I got saved. I had no church background, nothing. We, none of my family went to church, so... Just, uh, just the things that I've experienced for myself. I think sometimes Christians and the church get a black eye sometimes for a variety of reasons. Some of it we deserve. Sometimes the Christians and the church ain't doing what they're supposed to do. Sometimes we deserve it. But I've also seen sometimes where they got blamed for stuff as a Christian or a church that they didn't really have anything to do with. And I think it comes from sometimes expecting things from people that only God can do. There are some things only God can do. Now, God, does God use us? Yes, but there are some things only God can do. When you put your expectations on another person, they're going to fall short. They expected some things, and I'm like, it was, it's very unfair to expect something from a person that God, only God can do. Now, I know the church is made up of nothing more than God's people. That's who we are. We're a saved people. We're a forgiven people. But we're not a perfect people. Amen? Come on, we're not a perfect people. We fall short. I've had people say to me, I'm surprised you do that. And I, I'm like, why? Why would you be surprised that I do that? I'm a human being. What did you think I was? I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. Why would you be surprised I do certain things? And I get the same answer every time. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't think pastors did that. I'm like, why? I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I'm not sure what they, what, they thought I, what they thought I was. And sometimes those expectations are placed upon us as Christians, and it's very unfair because if they're looking at me, good, my gosh, they're going to fall short. I'm going to fall short. I said, because the scriptures that all fall short of the glory of God. Not some, all. You see, when God saved me, he did not expect me to stop being me. He didn't stop, expect me to stop. He wanted me to stop some of that stuff I was doing. He didn't expect me to stop being me. When you try to be someone else, nobody's going to be you. God created you unique. He created you special. He created you to be you. He wanted you born again, and you, when you got born again, praise God for that. God created you in His image. He, kept, he, he didn't expect you to change and all this other stuff stop being you. When we become saved, we have a new nature instilled in us with the help of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean you've got to stop being you. You know what? I had some well-meaning Christians. I really believe they meant well. When I first got saved, well, you should do this, or you should like this. or like I'm like, Why? I think that's God awful. Why would I do that? I think it's terrible. I, that's, I don't like anything like that. They were trying to make me in their image instead of God making me in his image. Now, I think they meant well. I really do. Now, the first book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 12. I'm going to read that scripture, one verse to you. It says, for now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know, just as I also am known. 
You see, everything's not going to be clear on this side of eternity. Sometimes you just got to step out in faith. You're not going to have all the answers. Everything is not always going to come together. You're not already going to know in advance many times. Sometimes you just got to step out. Now, we're going to break a few of these words down and bring that together, that scripture I just shared. Now, the word dimly, if you were to look up the meaning of that, it means an enigma. Wow. Well, okay. Secondary means of knowledge cannot convey, convey a clear image. In other words, a lot of times what you see in the mirror is not always what you, uh, what's there. Not always. Now, sometimes, you know, most of the time a mirror is a clear image, but if you go into certain mirrors, you know, just say you go into a fun house. Lord, help us. I don't want to look like that. You know what I mean? So you got to gotta have a complete picture, in other words. An enigma is a puzzle. Have you ever put the puzzle together? I haven't put a puzzle together in probably 35 years. But I, I remember you put a puzzle together, and have you ever been missing some pieces when you got done? Yes. You know what? What do you do? You focus on the one piece that's missing. Instead of if you got a thousand-piece puzzle, look at all the ones you got. You're looking at the one that's missing. But it's, the puzzle is not complete. It's not complete, and that's what we focus on. We're not, it, everything is not going to be complete. You're not going to see everything clearly here on this side. It's just not going to happen. Now, when the Apostle Paul wrote this, you've got to remember at the time, you know, we got the benefit of looking back at the Scripture and, and saying, you know what, um, you know what, this makes sense. Why didn't they couldn't figure this out? We got the benefit of already knowing these things. But when the Apostle Paul wrote these things, you've got to think, what was going on? Now, um, the book of Corinthians that Paul had wrote hadn't been written yet. Um, when he wrote it, later wrote it, obviously. Uh, John, uh, the, uh, John had not written his gospel. He didn't, hadn't written his three letters. He hadn't written Revelation at the time. So in other words, Paul only had a par partial revelation as he was living. So he had to step out on faith. Something, you know, he had to step out. I say that to say this. Yes, we do represent Christ. And we need to be kind of careful what we say sometimes and what we do. Sometimes we let our mouth get ahead of ourselves. You know, <laughs> you know I know I can't be the only one here. Yeah. Come on now. Somebody amen me. Make me feel amen. good. Make me feel good. Come on. You know, sometimes my mouth gets ahead of myself. You know what? I do represent Christ, and my actions should match my words. What I say should be how I live in my life. But unfortunately, we see a lot of people say a lot of things, and their life don't live line up with anything like that. It doesn't look anything like that. But I'm going to say this. Don't try to live your life to someone else's expectations of you. Because guess what? Everybody's going to be happy but you. I tried that. It don't work. I, some people have put expectations on me, and for whatever reason I tried to do that, I'm like, what am I doing? I am miserable. I am not doing this anymore. Guess what? If they're unhappy, they're unhappy. But I'm not going to do that anymore. God did not give me a life so I could walk around miserable, trying to live up to somebody's expectations of me. And I'm not going to do it anymore. The scripture we use today is really a prayer. When you sum this prayer up, it says a whole lot. You can sum that whole prayer up in three words. God is able. God is able. When you bring all those things together, when we, when we fall and we feel like there is no hope, how am I ever going to see a way out of this? You know, I don't have a chance to get this right. The scripture assures us God is able. You may have fallen short. You have, may have messed up, but I tell you, God is able. God is more than able to bring everything together. Yeah. You know what? He is not going to let you down. He is more than able. In the scripture we read in verse 21, it kind of it kind of thrown me for a loop there a little bit. And he says, to him be the glory in the church. I'm like, what in the world does that mean? See, I always ask God, you always, a professor taught me this, and I've said it many times in here. When you're reading scripture, when you always look at it, ask yourself this question is, what is God trying to say here? Because he's trying to say something and everything. What is God trying to say here? And I had to look at that. What is God trying to say here? And what I took from it is when we live for God, it changes things. Your life is going to be different when you live for God. It's just going to be different. Now, there's a guy that I read at times, uh, an author I read at times. Uh, maybe you've heard him, maybe you've not. Dallas Willard, maybe you've heard of him. If you don't know who he is, he's kind of like a modern-day C.S. Lewis, the best way I can put it. But he wrote this. I'm going to read this. It's about four or five lines here. I'm going to read this. I, I think it's really good. 
He said, to glorify God means to think and act in such a way that goodness, greatness, and the beauty of God are constantly obvious to ourselves and to those, all those around us. It means to live in such a way when people see us, they think, thank God for God, if God would create such a life. Wow, that's powerful. If somebody's thanking God for you, that's powerful. That means God is really doing a great work in your life. The problem with living, breathing churches is they got people in them. <laughs> they got people in them. Yes. They got people in them. Uh, sometimes, you know, we do great things for God. Other times, not so great. Sometimes we say things maybe we shouldn't. Sometimes we do things in life and our actions don't line up with the word. But, but a li living, breathing church, that's part of the plan, though. God knew that. People in churches at times are just a mess at times. People that have problems, people that are broken from things in life. People that you see every Sunday, you wouldn't believe what's going on in their life sometimes. Because sometimes we just keep things to ourselves. We don't want everybody to know everything. But those churches, the church today, is just like the church of yesterday in the past. The, the early churches that Paul was dealing with, these letters he wrote, most of these were the two of the church. Some of the things that Paul was dealing with in the early church, there's three things. I like Number three is my favorite. But the first thing is they incorporated crazy things into worship like pagan worship in the church, right? Okay. Secondly, they would ignore the needs of all the needy people in the community, and there was many. They, they act like it was no big deal. Now, number three was, is my personal favorite. Now, listen to this. They abused alcohol during communion. During communion, they were getting drunk. They were getting hammered during communion. Now, at least I know most of you all wait till Friday or Saturday night to do it. You know what I mean? You, you don't do it during communion. You know, I think, I think getting drunk during communion, I think God might make a face on that one. But I know this. Regardless of our flaws and shortcomings, God has made a way for us. Do I fall short? Yes. But does that mean I quit trying? No, I'm going to get back up because I, if I confess to God and come clean with him, he's faithful to forgive me. Amen. He's faithful to forgive me. It, you know what? When you, when you mess up, go to God. Be sincere about it. He will forgive you. How do I make sure God is glorified in my life and in the church? I, me starts with me because I, I, I'm responsible for me. When I stand before God and the church, we must not only have a commitment to God, we have to have a radical commitment. Sometimes the church, and even us as a, as a person, as a Christian, we lose sight of what exactly we're supposed to be doing. We get, we get off on other things and we make all these other things important. That when, when you make other things important, your commitment level to God actually will waver. And then you, you'll make the things that are unimportant, important. One of the other things, how do I uh, glorify God in my life in the church is helping uh, people find and follow Jesus to the best of my ability. Now, some people in their life, they are going to uh, have an influence and be able to affect thousands of people. Maybe you're called to affect one person in your entire lifetime to make a difference. Whatever it is, that's what we have to do. This is the main focus of the church. Because when Jesus gets a hold of you and truly gets a hold of you, when God has got you, things are going to change. Things are going to change. If the things that we're doing as Christians and as a church, if, we're not, if they're not achieving this, we need to stop doing those things. If we're not reaching the laws. I believe what, uh, what God... Uh, God's word says, all things are possible with God. Yes. Not just some, all things are possible with God. You know, at times, you know, we think, you know what, this is too far gone, I'm too far gone, and this person, you know, I don't even pray for them anymore. You don't realize what they've done. No, I may not. I may not understand it, but I know if this ain't nobody so far from God that God can't reach them. Amen. Nobody. God's love is redeeming. That not one person, who, there is not one person who can't be made new by God. 
I'm a perfect example of that. The church needs to be courageous to impact the world. But what as many times does the church do? We cower in the corner afraid to offend somebody. Why, well, sure, you look at this world, they sure are not afraid to offend us. We, we need to just, just, I'm not telling you to go out there and hit anybody over the head with what you believe. But when the opportunity arises, don't cower in the corner either. The early church impacted the world. Because ordinary people, which they were, did everyday things in extraordinary ways. They were just regular people. They weren't any different than me or you. You know, Jesus, some, he, had, he was fully God and fully human. But these, these disciples, the early church, they were just like me and you. There was no difference in us. It was their commitment level and their passion. They were just ordinary people. Everything we do matters. Nothing you do in the name of Jesus is irrelevant. I can't tell you how many times <coughs> people say, well, I don't have any gifts like that. I don't have anything that I can really do. You're making the things you're doing for God irrelevant, and you should not be doing that. Everything is relevant. I don't care how small, nothing is insignificant when you're doing it for God. You wouldn't realize the impact that you had. If you just continue to do the ordinary things, but just keep doing them, doing them in extraordinary, doing the best that you can, God will take the, the things that you think are shortcomings and He will use them greatly. Surely, if God was looking for the uh, the most <laughs> elegant speaker or the most you know who could do the best preaching, He would not have picked me. He wouldn't have picked me. Simply by living out our faith and what you say you believe. You say you believe this. Just live that out. Live out what you say you believe. That's as simple as that. The disciples in the early church changed the world simply by living out what they said they believed. Now, you say you believe in God and you say you're born again. Just live out that. I'm not asking you to do anything that you can't do. You do the best you can. And believe me, God will more than make up the shortcomings if you feel like you have any. Now, how do, how do I do that, you may ask? By doing ordinary things in the best way you can. Now, is that something you can handle? I mean, I can do that, you know, by doing ordinary things the best way you can. You would be surprised at the impact that you have in this world. Some of the people that have, that have really put a, something in my memory, or they just did ordinary things. Um, I can remember one time my... Service truck broke down. It was late at night. I was out on a call. It was like 9 o'clock. I hadn't even been home. I'd been out all day. And uh, I pulled in. My truck broke down. It started going down. I, I was out in the middle of nowhere. There was no...